Welcome to another episode of Jay Leno's Garage. Today we're going to talk about my 1963 uh, Corvette Stingray fuel injection car. Now, if you've been to this website before, you might have seen the book review we did. Pete Brock, who one of the designers of this car, wrote this fantastic book, Corvette Stingray, Genesis of an American Icon. And uh, we sat right in front of this car and talked about the history of Corvette, but we never discussed this actual car myself. So if you'd like to know more about Corvette Stingrays, this is a book to get. I want to introduce you to a man who uh, did this car for me. He is a master Corvette restorer. He's a, a Navy fighter pilot, a Vietnam veteran, uh, did drag racing for years, was quite successful, and has done something like 24 frame-off Corvettes. Mike, come on in. Mike McCluskey. How are you, Mike? Good, Jay. How are you, buddy? Good to see you. I bought this car sight unseen. I know you're not supposed to do that. And it was close. It was pretty good, but it needed a lot of things to bring it back to uh, stock. I like stock, especially with the hubcaps and the white wall tires. This is what it looked like back in 1963. When I was 13 years old, this is the car that knocked my socks off, as it did most kids uh, my age. I mean, not only did I have a 327, it was fuel injected. Oh my God. That's when 360 horsepower was huge. Most cars had 150. The Mustang had 271 with the Hypo in it. This is 360. This was the most powerful Corvette you could buy in 1963. Plus, it was a revolutionary body style. Uh, well, Mike knows more about it than just about anyone else. What were some of the challenges in doing this car? Well, the car needed a lot of little things. Yeah. Um, the car had been serviced for many years by people who service them at garages and service stations, and they don't know Corvettes. Right. So they may replace something that works correctly or, or maybe looks correct but doesn't work correctly, but non-Corvette. And I wanted to take the car back to as it was in 1963. I like to think maybe it's a little better than it was in 1963. Yeah, I think it's, it certainly looks better than it did probably in 1963. When you take a car like this and you try to make it compete with modern cars by cams and so much extra horsepower, I think you lose a little something. You do. 1963 was iconic. This was a one year only with the cost the controversial split window. Split back window. And I learned from you there are a lot of things that are unique in the 1963. You mentioned the hubcaps. Right. These hubcaps are 17 pieces in one of those hubcaps. <laughs> and uh, it's a beautiful hubcap, but in production it just didn't make sense. Right. So the 1964 hubcap was a single stamp stainless rim. As a result, you can't even find a 63 hubcap anymore. Yeah. Nobody's reproduced them. But so much, because this was sort of a prototype car, wasn't it? It was. And they kind of designed it as they went. And they did a lot of things that really were never going to work in production. Yeah. But they got the car done, they got it done on time, and they built 21,000 of these cars. About uh, a little over 10,000 of each, coupes and convertibles. But when it came to 64, they redesigned it so that you could actually build a car. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, and this is called a C2. Of course, the C1 uh, was, uh, was the first generation, of course, the C5. Uh, the C6, and of course the brand new C7, which you have, which I is do. very impressive. That's the ZR1 over there. This is kind of the Corvette section of the garage here. Uh, even this Mara is unique to 63, isn't it? Early 63 only. By mid-year they redesigned it. It was too low, it was hard to see out of, so they put a longer stem on it and changed the base, and, and so that's a, a one only early car. I mean, I learned a lot of things about this body style from Mike. Uh, they only did this, what, five years, this body style? Correct. And explain these louvers in the hood. Well, they're not actually louvers. They're made to look like louvers. But ex explain what happened there with Duntoff. It's a bezel that looks like louvers. Uh, Zora Duntoff was what we call the savior of the Corvette. He came on board in about 1956 when the Corvette was about to fail because they couldn't sell it. And he said, let me have that car for a couple of years and I'll make it saleable. He was a professional race car driver. And when he started drawing up this car, he said, okay, there's going to be pressure buildup in the engine room at high speeds, so we're going to put two large vents in the hood to dump that pressure out and keep the car on the ground. Well, when it came to production, they said, we can't fool with that, and what happens when the rain comes through and all? So they phonied up these bezels to look like it. Right. And the problem is, at 100 miles an hour, this car flies. Yeah, it tends to lift up. Exactly. It? The front yeah, wheels get really light. Yeah, we, we, we've heard that the front wheels get lighted. <laughs> we don't know that for sure. Over 100 miles an hour. We've been told. Many people believe, whatever you want to say. All right, just fine. And of course, this was, there was nothing sexier than seeing this on your Absolutely. car. Absolutely. You know, 
Today, when all cars are fuel injected, it doesn't seem like a big deal. But when you're 13 years old and suddenly you see this, the only other cars that had this were, I guess, the Mercedes, the 300 SL Gullwing, and only European cars were fuel injected. I mean, it was just so, uh, so exotic. Well, and this at the was time. revolutionary. It was yeah. designed by Zora. He said, well, I think we should have fuel injection and clear back in 57. They said, who would build that? And he says, well, who makes our carburetors? Right. Rochester. Oh, right. okay, well, we'll have them build fuel injection. Right. And so yeah. That's how it happened. But it was unique because it sensed barometric pressure. So as you climbed altitude, it supplied less gas to the engine, kept the air-fuel ratio correct, right. and it was revolutionary at its time. Let's talk about some of the other styling cues. Right here, Chevrolet has always had or had had for many years a kind of a, a phony vent there. Right. And they continued all the way up to 67. They actually made it a functional vent. Was, was there any talk of making these vents functional? They were in the later coupes. Yeah. They made them functional on one side because right. they thought you had stale air in the back. Right. So they put a pump back here and pump fresh air into the compartment. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. When I first got this car, there were so many things wrong with it. For example, I didn't know about this little ball in here. You mentioned this. Explain that. Yeah, that little wheel was uh, the latching mechanism for the gas cap. And uh, it was just something somebody thought of in the middle of the night, put it on the car. It was a terrible design. It was always out of adjustment. And by 80, or 64, they just put a little plastic cam, spring-loaded cam, so and replaced the wheel. So that's a 63 only cap. 63 only. Plus, when I got this car, it had a trailer hitch on it. Why anybody put a trailer hitch? On a Corvette. It was just a car know. in those days. We had to repair it as well. Plus something else unique, you told me, the exhaust system. This had a later exhaust system on it, didn't it? The early 63s, they put two boxes underneath the seats, only half a year. And they thought you could keep tools or things under there. Well, it was a terrible idea. If you ever put a tool under there, you were never going to get it back out. Yeah, because you have to take the seat out to get to it? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so so when, when this car was gone through by the first guy in 1988, he just said, put new exhausts on it, and he put a 64 exhaust system. Okay. The 64 exhaust system was against those two plastic boxes. Oh, it didn't have the bend. Exactly. Yeah. It, it needed to curve around it. 63 only exhaust system. Right. It was actually burning the fiberglass, and you stood a good chance of burning the car to the ground with wow. that system. Okay. And of course, the iconic split window. You know, I remember uh, a friend of mine's dad bought one of these, and when it was a year old, he didn't want to look old fashioned, so he had a body shop cut out this panel and put the 64 in so it would look a like year a, newer. A year newer. Yeah, because the, probably, you know, the value of the cards went through the floor. But, I had a 58 Corvette that had phony louvers. Yeah. And I put a 59 hood on it so it would look like a 59. Yeah, well, there you go. That's what people did back in the day. To me, I love the split window. And I, to this day, I don't know whether this is the most valuable car because the split window or because it was one year only. You know? All of the above. This yeah, was yeah. the most, and is to this day, the most collectible coupe. Right. And the designers wanted this wind split to be continuous the whole length of the car. Yeah. And in order to do that, they said, well, let's just leave a little post in the middle. And of course, this had been done by people as early as Volkswagen. Right. But Zora Duntoff, being a pure race guy, hated it. And yeah. he fought with the designers for the whole production of this car. And by 64, he'd won out. And they said, yeah. get rid of the splits. So well, they know, created a classic. You can see the split window in the back of the Cord, my mm -hmm. Winchester Cord, exactly. or the back of right. the uh, Bugatti. So I, it was very European looking, I thought. I thought sure. it was quite attractive at the time. White wall tires, of course, which nobody does anymore in sports cars. But that was quite common. And uh, when you see ads for 63, even XKEs in America, they had the white wall tires. And I think yeah. it was about $8 more. Yeah, $8 more. Well, hey, what the heck? Uh, let's open the hood and show people what's under the hood. Let's Great. take a look. Okay. All right, that was the most confusing looking thing when you were 13 years old compared to any car you had seen before. Uh, and there are so many things that are unique to this fuel injected car, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. I had a friend of mine whose dad operated an auto repair shop. And when a fuel-injected Corvette had come in, he'd say, let's get rid of that thing. Yeah. And he'd put a carburetor and an intake manifold on it and put these things on the shelf. Oh, really? That's... He ended up with 40 of them. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But they were troublesome back in the day, weren't they? They were troublesome if you didn't understand them. Right. Yeah. They, they, they make a lot of sense, and they work beautifully if they're kept clean and if they're kept properly tuned. Right. Now, a lot of things are unique to this. Uh, just this whole air cleaning unit 
Those are hard to come by, aren't they? They are, yeah. yeah. If you can find an original, it's several thousand dollars. Wow. Um, that is the original early 63 air cleaner. It was right. changed slightly later in the year. And the fuel pump and the tack is driven off the back of the distributor, correct? Correct. There's, yeah. there's a gear drive in the distributor and two cables, one okay. facing aft for the tachometer and one facing forward for the high-pressure fuel pump. So you have two fuel pumps. Correct. It has the correct factory pump that brings six to eight pounds of pressure up to here, and then the high-pressure pump that takes the pressure up enough so that it will atomize properly in right. the fuel injection. And, of course, you have your single master cylinder and all that fancy dual master cylinder stuff that wouldn't come for a few more years. And this car has independent suspension, first year of that, isn't it? For the rear suspension to be yeah. independent, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's what we call a swing axle. Right. And you also have drum brakes all the way around. Discs had not come in. Right. Two more, two more years. 65 was the first year for okay. disc brakes. Okay. There's a good story about this. You've seen the thumb screw on these? Right. Well, everybody thinks that's correct for 63. It's only correct if it doesn't have the power brake booster. Oh, I see. When they put the power brake booster on, they move the master cylinder forward and up, and the thumb screw hit the hood. So that's how you got a bolt. Oh, I see. Well, that's funny. Okay. See, this is all completely useless information. It means nothing unless you're a Corvette person. <laughs> if you want to bore your friends to death, just tell them all this minutia stuff, and they will leave. It will be fantastic, <laughs> and you'll have all the room to yourself. Happens uh, every day. That's right. I mean, Mike, as I said, is a master of story. We've got to correct hoses, to correct everything. So now you want it to be exactly as it was in 1963. Um, let's see, what else have we got before we take it for a spin? Uh, of course, aligning the headlights, that was tricky. W were they pretty good when they came from the factory? Or were they... they were. They, yeah. they had an alignment uh, shop in the factory, and yeah. they were pretty close. Uh, what was nightmarish was the electric motors that opened and closed them. Yeah. Uh, the grease tended to congeal, and after a few years, you had to go through them and clean them up and regrease them. And... Right, right. But still, one of the greatest looking cars. I mean, it's hard to convey how exciting this car was when it came out. There really were no exciting. The Mustang was still a year away. Uh, so Corvette had everything to themselves. This was the most yeah. exciting American car. No, Mustangs were around, yeah. Well, 64. 60, 64 and a half is 64 what they called Mustang. April yeah. 17th. That's more <laughs> useless information. So this was a car that was just unbelievable. Four-speed transmission. Uh, when we take it out for a ride, we'll show you uh, the dash and everything like that and, and what's necessary. But um, I think it's time to go for a ride. All right, let's go over the controls of the 63. Start with the center console here. Pull this out for temperature, right? Correct. And then your fan speed is right, right here it going. Okay. All right. Then if you want it to blow on the window, you pull the defroster right. cable out. Okay, push that back in. And this is obviously your radio. Right. Uh, I don't know why I used to think this is so sexy, the radio put in sideways, but I don't know why. People love that. Of course, you got your ashtray, your four-speed gearbox right here, your glove box. Nice size glove box in these things, as you can see get more than a pair of gloves in there. Your ignition, temperature gauge, oil pressure, lighter. That's what it's still called, the lighter, not a power accessory. Correct. Uh, tachometer. I see we're idling about, what, 850? That's, That's about right. Speedometer. Then you have your wipers over here, your headlights, your uh, electric switch to turn your, your headlights, uh, the, open them up. The doors. Yeah. Open the doors. And, of course, your fuel gauge here. And, of course, uh, this old-fashioned parking brake always makes me laugh. Seems like something right out of Chevy Bel Air and Impala. 63 as opposed to, only. Yeah, that's only 63 had that, didn't it? Yeah. Then they went to the center. Right, right. Okay, I guess we're ready to go. Let's take it for a ride. You know, it was a different time in America in 63. You go, you can have a Ferrari or a Corvette Stingray. No, I don't know. I think I'm going to go with the Stingray. It had more horsepower, faster. And it was sexier. Yeah. But you know, it's a wonderful driving car. I mean, it's hard to believe this car is half a hundred years old. I mean, it's, it's more than 50 years old. It's ageless styling. I and know. Everybody still loves the look of this car. Yeah, yeah. I was 22 years old. I saw a 63 parked at the curb in 1963, and I stopped and walked around that car for two hours. Yeah. I was just stricken by it. Well, this car right here is exactly half the age of the automobile in America. If you figure 1903 is about when it happened, 50 years later you had this, and of course 50 years on from this we have the new C7.
When I was a kid, I remember working on Model A's and Model T's. They seemed so simple. And this seems so complicated with <laughs> backup lights and brake lights and all those guys. And now this seems almost childlike. It's so simple. What's a power brake booster? I know. I know. It's amazing. It's amazing. Like the Lamborghini Miura, this is a car that's fun to drive swiftly. I know if I would want to drive it fast because it might just be a little scary in terms of brake technology and tire technology, but to drive it swiftly on a two-lane road, oh, it's just it's just wonderful. But it's very communicative. I mean, you can feel what the car is doing. I, back in the 50s, the three-speed was the standard, right? You paid extra for the four-speed? Exactly. Well, in, in the mid-50s, the two-speed power glide was standard on the Corvette. Well, I can remember reading uh, literature from the 30s and stuff, and some manufacturers bragging their car only had a three-speed. You only had to shift three times, not four. And that was, you know, we can do it in three, whereas the other car, you need four, you know. You know, I like resto mods, and I've got a few myself, but a base stock 63 Corvette coupe like this is still the best looking to me. This car was built on, what, December 12, 1962, right? That's correct. They started making them in late September. This right. was uh, car number 4,000 and change. And this was the most successful Corvette model up to that point, right? Absolutely. The, the 62 actually sold a few more units than the 63, but only because they couldn't make enough 63s. Right, right. They sold every one they built. I remember seeing my first ad for this car. In fact, I had that ad uh, made into a painting, and it's hanging in my garage right now. In fact, they even put myself in the ad. Here, take a look. I know, it's kind of stupid, but it... Back in these days, everything was optional. You paid $12 for the mirror, another $12 for the other mirror over there, which is always useless because they put it right in front of the post. And this, of course, the original color of the car, silver with black interior. 3,500 cars came in silver. Oh, is that right? That's quite a few, isn't it? It is about uh, a fourth of the production. Yeah. It's the most popular color. Oh, is that right? Not red, huh? No. R red was nearly as popular, like 3,000 of these. Right. Fuel injection. Was there a suspension option in 63? No. no. You know, it's funny, reading the road test of the period, they say you could order the Z06 package with the 30-gallon gas tank and all this other stuff. But you wouldn't want to do that because it's probably too expensive. And it was just a couple of hundred dollars. Now those cars are million-dollar cars, aren't they? Absolutely. Right. Yeah, they're crazy. heard about like the Corvette restorers and all the little minutia with this needs to be cat plated, this needs to be whatever. I used to think it was silly, but then you realize, well, how are you ever going to know if you get in a real car, you know? So when you get a car that's Bloomington Gold or certified by a guy like Mike, you know you've got the real thing, and it's really a valuable service. Well, it's nice that you appreciate that. Oh, yeah. Remember the song about the Stingray and the 409? Yeah. When Pete Brock and Larry Chenard and all those guys, they just did such a great job on the styling of this car. Shinoda was the major player in that deal. Right, right. Now these 327s are pretty bulletproof. I mean, all the Europeans use them. Vizzerini, uh, any number of European auto manufacturers put this engine in their car. I can't remember on Route 66, did they switch to a later model Corvette on the TV show, do you remember? Yes, I know exactly what they did. They used the 
the 60 for the first three years right. and the 61 for the fourth year. Oh, okay. But never went to this no. the C2. No, no okay. it's always solid axle. Yeah. And that's the stock exhaust system on there. We want to do this car completely stock. That's why it's not as probably as throaty as it could be, but it's uh, very enjoyable. And you really get the sense of what the car was like back in 1963. That was the mission. How many of these are left? How many 63s do you think are left? Uh, that would be just a guess, but I would think probably half of them have survived. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because initially people knew this was going to be a special car. Right. So many Corvettes were never special at the outset, and so they didn't survive. Right. An example would be the old uh, six-cylinder Corvettes. Right. 53s and 54s. There was nothing special about them. Now they command a lot of money because there aren't many of them. Yeah. Well, there you have it. Suddenly it's 1963. I want to thank Mike, our uh, master restorer, who did a wonderful job on this car. It was a nice car, but like a lot of old cars, just people done fixes on fixes and there were just so many little broken things that were wrong with it and uh, Mike was able to go through it and uh, fix them all and make it exactly as it was in 1963 so uh, again just a fantastic car this is an exciting piece of my boyhood uh, I never dreamed I would have one of these so it took me 50 years but by golly we got one Mike thank you very much Jay thank you for giving me the opportunity to do the car there you go see you next week Mm-hmm. <laughs>